Good morning, it's Annie with Manor Farms Homestead. So I'm here in the kitchen this morning. It's very hot and humid outside, so I'm gonna to try to stay inside as much as possible today. I do have a refrigerator full of milk, so after I milked this morning and brought up my three gallons, um, I knew that I had to get milk out of the refrigerator because I had no more room, so it's time to make cheese. As is typical with what I do before I make cheese, because I milk jerseys, they produce a lot of milk fat. This is my jug of milk, and that's my cream line. That is a huge amount of cream, way over a three and a half percent that you would see in whole milk. Again, another gallon, large amount of cream. So I'm gonna skim at least half the cream off of all of my gallons of milk and use that to make butter. That will still give me just about a whole milk um, that I'm using to make my cheese. So I have a lot of cheese videos. I've made cheddar before. I'll link to that video. I'm actually making one vat of cheddar today and I'm going to make one vat of Colby. So today's video is really gonna be about the Colby because I don't have a video showing how to make Colby. So Colby is a washed curd cheese, similar to making Gouda, but Gouda you wash it with hot water. Colby is washed with cold water. So we'll show you the process as we go. Right now I'm just gonna get all of my milk skimmed, partially skimmed, and into my pots. All right, we've got all of our milk into our two vats. We've got five and a half gallons of milk in the bigger pot, four and a half gallon in the smaller. The bigger pot we're using for our cheddar cheese, the smaller one we're gonna use for the Colby. The Colby's gonna soak up some of that wash water that we use, so it's gonna make more curd volume initially. So that's why I'm using the smaller volume of milk for that so that everything will fit into my actual uh, mold. Um, for Colby and cheddar, they're both mesophilic culture cheeses. Um, typically what I use for my cheddar is buttermilk, M100, MA11, uh, Flora Danica, something like that for a cheddar cheese. Buttermilk is one of my favorite cultures to use in cheddar cheese. Um, since I did use a large volume of milk today, I'm just going to use culture. So. I'm actually experimenting around with this and we're going to use an aroma B culture today just to see how that goes. I've not used it in cheddar before. I have used it with cream cheese. It has excellent flavor so that's more of an experiment that I'm working on. If it turns out great I'll probably do a video and show you show you that but we're just I'm just playing around with some different cultures. I like to experiment with the, with my cooking in the kitchen. For Colby again just a basic mesophilic culture so you could use buttermilk you could use M100, you could use MA11, Floridanica, any of those are fine. The M100 is gonna give you more of a CO2 production, so you may have some little holes in your cheese. M11, MA11 is just your basic mesophilic standard flavored uh, culture. Um, produces kind of that cheddar-y type flavor. So that's what we're gonna use for our Colby today, MA11. Just a standard mesophilic culture for that today. So right now, for both cheddar and Colby, um, our goal temperature is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. I always, when I'm making two different types of cheeses, try to match up times that they need to ripen, temperatures that they need to get to so that I can kind of go back and forth between the two. Um, a lot of times I'll make the same thing in the same day, uh, but I did want to make some Colby today and I only have room for one wheel of cheese in my brine, so that's why I'm doing one of cheddar. Um, we'll get this up to 86 degrees and at that point we're going to add our culture and let it ripen. Now there is, di there is a different ripening time on cheddar versus Colby. Cheddar ripens for 90 minutes, Colby ripens for 60 minutes. We may go a little bit over on the Colby because my goal is, while this is ripening, to go deal with my garden and maybe get a shower and cleaned up uh, since I've been outside sweating and milking cows this morning. So that's the goal right now, just getting them up to temperature. And I'll bring you back in just a few minutes once we add our um, culture and our anata coloring at that time. All right, we've got our milk almost up to temperature. I'm gonna go ahead and add the annata while um, the last couple of degrees come up to 86. So for this four and a half gallon vat, I'm putting one teaspoon of annata in it. 
It's not an exact science on the annata. That's just adding color to your cheese. It doesn't change the flavor or properties of your cheese at all. With my annata, I always mix it in with a little bit of cool water. And right now I'm using the same spoon and my two pots of milk because I haven't added the culture yet. Once we add the culture, we'll change spoons so we're not um, inoculating each pot with different cultures. So it doesn't do a lot to the color of the milk right now. Um, you'll see this darken more once you strain out your curds. I've got my little helper in the background cleaning all my jugs so we can use them again. When you're making cheese, make sure you have really good thermometers that are calibrated. Otherwise, your recipe may not turn out how you had planned. All right, this one's sitting at about 84, and this one is at about, once I stir it, looks like we're at 86. I'm gonna turn the heat off of this one. I'll turn this one down low. Now, I usually heat my milk relatively rapidly, um, usually at about, a medium heat. I just stir frequently to get it up to temperature as quickly as possible. All right, so this is our Colby. This is our cheddar. We're going to go ahead and do our culture for our Colby since it's at temperature. I typically shoot for about an eighth of a teaspoon of culture for two gallons of milk. We have four and a half gallons of milk, um, so we'll go for just a teeny bit over a fourth of a teaspoon. This is our culture. And that's the MA11 mesophilic culture. I have a sterilized measuring spoon and it's very dry. This is an eighth of a teaspoon. So we're gonna sprinkle this very lightly over the top. And that's two eighths of a teaspoon but just a teensy, teensy bit more. Not an exact measurement. I'm gonna stir up our Colby. Just kind of a top to bottom motion for stirring it to get it completely mixed in. Once these are mixed in, again, this is gonna go for 90 minutes, 60 on your Colby typically. We may go a little over on that and we're not gonna sweat it. You're gonna to want to cover these with lids while they sit for that length of time. I take my thermometers out during this time have clean sterilized lids. Again, these pots are clean and sterilized. When you're making cheese, it's paramount that everything you're using is nice and clean and sterilized so that you're not inoculating your cheese with some bad bacteria. Cheese, there's a saying, is made in the pot. Um, so however this comes out in the pot, you can't age bad cheese, <laughs> bad bacteria out of cheese. So take extra precautions with all of your equipment that you're using to make sure it's sterilized. So because I do use quite a bit of rennet in my cheese making, I buy it in bulk. Um, here I'm pouring out of a one liter container into my small rennet container that I do store in the house. Uh, the other one gets stored in an outdoor refrigerator. Uh, the smaller one is easier to measure for for most of the batches of cheese that I make. I've got two containers here because I'm working with a Colby and a Cheddar. The Colby was already measured up and now I'm moving on to the measurements for my Cheddar uh, batch. In this particular video I was doing a five and a half gallon batch of Cheddar and a four and a half gallon batch of Colby. So what you see me measuring for the cheddar is based on the same ratio that I used for my Colby. I typically use 
um, a fourth of a teaspoon of rennet for every one gallon of milk. So for a four gallon batch of cheese, I would use one teaspoon of rennet. Um, I'm adjusting those measurements just slightly here uh, to accommodate slightly more uh, milk. Make sure you stir your rennet into your cool non-chlorinated water before use. I do have my own spoon for the Colby. Now because this is raw milk, it's not homogenized, it's not pasteurized, all of this cream has risen to the top. So you're gonna to wanna to get this stirred back in. Now keep in mind, we did skim about half of our cream off of this, but there is still a lot of cream in this milk. So make sure you get that stirred back in. Before you add the rennet. So once you've got your cream mixed back in, you're ready for adding your rennet. And again, this is mixed in with just cool, non-chlorinated water. And I did not mention earlier, if you are not using raw milk, you do need to add calcium chloride at the step where you add your annatto and your culture um, to form a firmer curd. Raw milk doesn't need that, but if it's been pasteurized, it just doesn't form quite the same curd. And you do need to add that calcium, chlor calcium chloride uh, to form a better curd. So we're just gonna add this in and you're gonna stir for no more than one minute in a top to bottom method to get it completely incorporated. should be adequate and let it come to a rest. We're going to go ahead and cover this pot and it is going to sit and coagulate for 45 minutes which is the same that we're going to do over here for our cheddar. So here for the cheddar we're doing the same thing. We're going to stir that cream back in One of the things that I found early on with making cheese with Jersey milk is that if I did not skim the fat, there was so much fat that at the end of the cheese making, it would just float to the top as butter and it would not incorporate with the cheese. So it was kind of a waste of a lot of that cream. I put it to better use by making butter with it. Now for Colby and cheddar, these are gonna sit for 45 minutes to coagulate before we cut them into curds. So we're gonna get our timer set. And we will be back. So I just wanted to show you what else is going on in our kitchen over here. Elizabeth is about as creative as her mother and she is making lip gloss. What all did you put in it, Elizabeth? 16 grams of castor oil, 10 grams of olive oil, six grams of coconut oil, three grams of beeswax, and four grams of liquid lecithin, and one gram of e-oil. What about your mica powder? Uh, How many teaspoons of that did you put? One. One teaspoon of my red mica powder to give it its color? Mm-hmm. Her lip balm or uh, lip gloss is really awesome. So she's over here mixing that up while I'm making cheese. So we're looking back on our kitchen in here. We've got quite the mess. We've got all our wash jugs in the background, cheese on the stove, Elizabeth making lip gloss. And like I told you earlier on that break while our milk was culturing, I went out and checked the garden for anything that needed to be harvested. This bucket is full of pickling cucumbers, 
salad cucumbers and I have one little zucchini in here. It's small, but I like to eat them at that point before they get big and tough. These are the uh, salad cucumbers. Uh, they don't hold up well for pickling. They get really soft, but they're fantastic in salads. I tend to make just cucumber salads. Um, I've had some broccoli too that I'll mix cucumbers and broccoli and make a salad. These are your pickling cucumbers. These will stay crunchy through the pickling process. This is a good pickling size cucumber. I have some down in here that are a little bit bigger and I may cut these into spears for pickling, but we're gonna make some dill pickles. I have plenty of fresh dill out in the garden as well. This is my little colander full of peppers. Lots of jalapeno or serranos. Typically the jalapenos are really rounded on the end, so these may be serranos. Um, they were supposed to be a hybrid giant jalapeno, but they look more like a serrano. They're very mild. They ha do have some spice to them, but they're not overwhelmingly hot. If you leave the seeds and veins in, they're much more spicy, but if you take those out, they're very mild. Also had quite a few of nice bell peppers out there, and then I left some out there to turn orange, yellow, and red. So the plan is to pickle some cucumbers and pickle some hot peppers. We have some eggplants. These are not giant by any stretch of the imagination, but we have some decent sized ones. We did have several that, no, that's a tomato. We did have several tiny little um, eggplants, but it's definitely ripe because that end has turned brown. The plants were kind of crowded and I think that may have contributed to these small ones. Um, the other option is that they need a little fertilizer because this is the first year that I've used this bed and the soil is not amended like I would like it to be. And there's our first vine ripe tomato, which looks perfect. We had kind of a knotty one over here. These are not growing well, this particular bed. I've had a lot of end, rot, uh, end blossom rot, so definitely needs some calcium. It definitely needs some amendment. This is the first year on this particular bed. It actually had a lot of bags of commercial garden soil, so not a lot of my normal compost. So we will certainly work on amending that bed. So it's been 45 minutes since we added the rennet to our milk. It should be nicely coagulated, but we are gonna check and make sure we have a nice firm curd before we go ahead and cut this. You can let it sit longer if you need to, but we'll check it and see. We'll start out here on our Colby. One good indication that you have a good firm curd is you'll see your um, your chunk of milk kind of pulling away from the edges of your pan. So I see that already on this. I'm gonna scoot you in closer so you can see what we're doing. So if you have a smaller pan, you can certainly just use a long knife because I use these big pots. I have this long, um, it's almost like a cake icer, but I bought it from cheesemaking.com and it's made for slicing your curds in a deep pot. So what you wanna to do to check to make sure your curds are ready to cut is just kind of push down. She could not get a, you should get a nice clean break. You see the separation of the whey there on top and the curd below it. So that's ready to go. Now for Colby, you're gonna to want to make half inch um, checkerboard cuts across your cheese. gonna let this sit for five minutes just to kind of heal. All right, so five minutes has elapsed. We've allowed our curds to heal. 
They do still need to be cut down into a smaller size. So what I use for that is this balloon whisk. And make sure your hands are sterilized because this is not gonna reach all the way down into the bottom without you submerging part of your hand in here. So here we go. I go all the way down to the bottom, all the way over, back up, all the way over. And I do that in each section. Now, then I typically go the opposite direction a couple of times across the top and the same thing across the bottom. You will still have some curds that evade the whisk and will still need to be cut with a spoon. After I do this, I usually will let these sit another five minutes to heal. Always cover your curds while they're resting. All right, so after that additional five minute heal, we're ready to go ahead and start scalding our um, curds, bringing them slowly up to 102 degrees. And this is the same uh, procedure for cheddar as it is for Colby. Um, over 30 minutes, we'll bring it up to 102 degrees. We will slowly stir our curd, breaking up any large curds that we see in there that didn't get broken up by the whisk. And just watching for these curds to firm up and release more whey. And it's just a very slow, gentle stir. And we'll go back and forth between the two pots because this is the same concept. 30 minutes, slow stir, reaching a goal temperature of 102 over that 30 minute stir. So you're looking at maybe three degrees or so every five minutes to reach that point. And as you stir, if you see any really large, I lost it, any really large curds, just break them up with your spoon. Right now, you can't truly appreciate the color that the annata is going to give to our final cheese. But as these lose the way and consolidate into firm little curds, they'll become more and more orangey yellow. And then as we press them in our um, cheese press and mold, they'll become more and more orangey yellow. So I think our curds are about where we need them to be here for our Colby. So what I'm going to do is just let these settle under the way for about 10 minutes. And that's going to give us um, access to get all of this whey scooped off of our curds down to the level of the curds. Then we're gonna start adding our cool water. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and start dipping this whey off down to the level of the curds. I just use a clean, sterilized colander and I've got my milk tote here that I'm going to pour this into so we can take it down to the pigs. So we've removed a little over a gallon of this whey and I'm starting to have curds creep in here. So we're pretty much down to the curd level. I'm going to stop there. Now we're going to add our cool water. So the initial cooling process is adding water that's at about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And then from there, we want to get our curds down to between about 80 to 85 degrees. All right, we're going to get our thermometer back in here. And we're going 
gonna start adding our cool water. So initially our thermometer really wasn't reaching our current level, so it looked like it was cooler than it is. We'll just add a little bit of this at a time to slowly bring these curds down to 80 to 85 degrees. Remember we were starting at 102 degrees. this water is going to replace that whey which is quite acidic um, and create a sweeter cheese. It also pulls moisture into these curds because it's cold water. When you make gouda you use hot water and it pulls moisture out of your curds. So Colby is a higher moisture cheese. It has kind of more of an elastic texture to it. So we're at about 91 degrees right now. We want to get down to 85, 80, 85. We're just going to keep slowly adding our 75 degree water. It looked like our temperature went up, but it's just that our thermometer probe wasn't very long, so it really wasn't getting all the way down into the curds. So we're actually at about 95, 96 degrees right now. We've still got a half gallon of cool water to add. This way that we've added all of this water to is very dilute. I'm not going to offer that to our pigs. It's just going to go to the garden because that's how I usually make my garden way is diluted about 50-50 with water and that's what we've got here. So we've reached about 85 degrees. That's where we want to be. We're going to let this settle. we are going to dip this off again, add even colder water, and get it down to about 75 degrees on our curds. All right, so we're back over here with the Colby cheese. So it's time to drain this dilute whey off of this. I've got a jug that we'll use because this is going to the garden, not the pigs, since it's very dilute. Using again just a little pitcher. This here is really good for your peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, anything that can benefit from some calcium um, to prevent in blossom rot. This is super good for the soil. It's got live microbes that are good for your plants. Natural source of protein, which turns into nitrogen in the soil. So a, a real good organic natural fertilizer for your garden. I've grown fantastic peppers for several years, and this is the main thing that I use to fertilize them. Okay, so we pulled off that additional two gallons of water that we added back to this. We're back down to the level of the curds and we're ready to add our even cooler water. So we are right at 85 degrees on these. 
I used the longer thermometer for this so that we reach down to the bottom. I've got some very cold water over here. Probably colder than what we need. I used a lot of ice. So I'm gonna kind of dilute this with just some regular tap water. We really want to be at about 60 degrees on this. Our goal is to get this down to about 75 degrees on our curds. We're going to slowly start adding this and stirring our curds. So right now at about 81 degrees. So we need to drop it about six degrees more. And I may have not mentioned, but this is non-chlorinated water that you're going to want to add to your cheese. We're on well water here, so I kind of take that for granted. If you're on city water, county water, where it's chlorinated, then get you some distilled water. We're right at 75 degrees now. So we're just gonna let these curds settle. So a little different technique here with our Colby. We do have our sanitized cheesecloth. I have thoroughly rinsed this out after it soaked in a bleach water solution. And we're going to put this directly into our cheese mold because there's no cheddaring process with Colby. And we've got this sterilized again so we're not mixing our cultures. We're just gonna start scooping our curd Flatter surface would be better here, so we're not flopping around. In fact, give me just a second, we're gonna fix this. All right, we've got a little bit better setup here, so it's not wobbly on us. And I just quickly ran these two through my soapy bleach water to get them sterilized. I know everyone's tired of hearing me say sterilized, but it's super important with making cheese. I've ruined batches of cheese by not being meticulous about, meticulous about everything being perfectly sanitized and sterilized. So while cheddar cheese, we add our salt to it at the end of the cheddaring process, Colby cheese has to be brined because we take this fresh curd and put it into our cheese mold and press it. So all of its salt will come from the brine. 
Now I do have a video on the different salting methods for cheese and I tell you how to make the brine in that video so I'll link to that video in the description of this one. So you can reference that on making your brine for Colby. Okay, so we're now moving on to pressing our Colby. I've gotten all of our curd out of the diluted whey. We're gonna just spread our cheesecloth over the top of this as evenly as possible. So when we were first putting it in there, it looked like there wasn't enough cheesecloth for the cheese, but there was, it just has to kind of settle a little bit and you don't want a lot of overlapping cheesecloth because it'll make little lines and creases in your cheese. So I use the smallest piece of cheesecloth that I can get away with. And then I just try to stretch it as flat as possible while covering all of the cheese. I've got sterilized followers and I have sterilized draining trays that go with my cheese press. Now I have two different types of cheese presses which is why I'm able to make two vats of cheese at one time now. Um, this is the probably the easiest one to use. You can't use as much weight with this one but it's adequate for a Colby. So we're bringing this out of our little draining colander. We'll put this onto our draining mat. I do have a little bowl underneath that draining tray. And this is fairly level with the top of that um, mold. So I'm going to add one more follower that's a little bit smaller. Then this sits on top of that. We have our weighted springs that go on here. The next piece goes on and then we have these little weights that you'll use to push down and hold your weight. So initially we're gonna press pretty light it's going to be 10 pounds for 15 minutes. And there's a little gauge on the front of this um, press that shows you where 10 pounds is. One of the things with this type of press, because it's spring loaded, as that whey drains out of this, you will lose your weight very quickly at first because it's going to press this down and not have as much um, weight on that. So you'll want to keep an eye on it a lot at first and you may have to continue pushing it down and adding that weight to keep it at the 10 pounds. I'll tip it over like this and let some of the whey drain out into our dish. And we'll just keep an eye on that for about 15 minutes. And this is that little gauge there in the front that shows you how much weight you're applying to your cheese. And you just push these down. These little weights up here at the top hold the pressure on it. All right, it's been 15 minutes. I got about a full bowl of whey that drained out of this just at the 10 pounds. 
Now we're gonna bump this up to 20 pounds and it's gonna go for about 30 minutes. And I did have to adjust this several times over that initial 10 minutes just because, like I said, it loses the pressure, the weight, as that weigh drains off. So we'll time this for about 30 minutes and we will come back. Okay, so we're still monitoring our Colby over here. I've got to add just a tiny bit more weight to keep it at the 20 pounds. And it's time to deal with our cheddar. All right, 30 minutes has elapsed. So we're going to go ahead and bump our weight up on the Colby. We're now going to go up to 40 pounds and it's going to sit like that for 90 minutes. After the 90 minutes, we're going to take it out of the mold, rewrap it, and bump it up to 50 pounds, and it'll stay like that overnight. So for adjusting this, we just push this down till our little dial shows 40 pounds, and we're good. So that's our Colby. Okay, so we've done the 90 minutes at 40 pounds of pressure. We're ready to actually flip this cheese, rewrap it and put it at 50 pounds overnight. <laughs> Smells really good. It's always a plus. Always smell your cheese throughout the cheese making process. If it's gone bad, you usually know pretty early on. So the cheddar that I was working on earlier had a very off smell. So at some point during our process, it came in contact with something that contaminated it. And I went ahead and dumped it just based on experience can't age bad cheese out of bad cheese so cut our losses I wasn't even gonna worry with salting it because it already had an off smell this smells like cheese should smell and it's nice and springy and exactly like Colby should be it's consolidating nicely so we're gonna get our cheese cloth all pulled up around the edges so we don't leave a bunch of indentions in it When you're making cheese, it is best to not have anything else going on in your kitchen, other people making stuff. It's best to just make cheese because your cheese can get contaminated with other stuff. If, if uh, raw vegetables, cooking, anything like that's going on, bread making particularly, Right, so this will go into its final press, 50 pounds overnight. Tomorrow morning, we'll take it out and we will get it into our brine. And like I said, I will link to my video where I make a brine so that you have that for reference. All right, that's it for now. So it is the next morning and we're ready to brine our cheese. Unfortunately, when I got my brine out of my cheese cave, this is what I found. Look at all that mold. Your brine should not mold. So I'm not sure what happened with this one, but this is definitely not usable. Um, we're gonna get a fresh brine mixed up. Okay, so despite me thinking I was not making a brine for this video, I am making a brine. So we're going to go ahead and measure out our salt. For a standard brine, you're going to need a gallon of non-chlorinated water, and you're going to need 2.25 pounds of salt to make a saturated salt brine. So let me set this on 
pounds and ounces. There we go. You do not want to use iodized salt. I'm using just a canning and pickling salt, which has no iodine, has no other ingredients in it except for salt. kind of clumpy, but that is fine because we're dissolving this. You could also use sea salt, which I used last time. It just takes a long time if you have a coarse sea salt for it to dissolve. I'm making a mess here. In addition to the salt, you're going to want, we're going to zero this back out, we're going to change it to grams. We need 10 grams of our calcium chloride pellets, so the recipe calls for one tablespoon of a 30% solution of calcium chloride. I've always used the pellets, which can be diluted with water. So, 10 grams of this diluted in one tablespoon of water is what we need. These will soak up moisture from the air, so I keep them in their package plus in another airtight bag. Alright, so we're going to get back over to our brine station. Okay, so we've got our bin sterilized run through some soapy bleach water. And we're gonna start off with our gallon of non-chlorinated water. Cool water. Salt dissolves better in hot water, but you do want your, your brine to be um, cool to room temperature. Storing your brine in your cheese cave at about 50 to 52 degrees is perfectly fine. It typically should not mold due to the high salt content, so I'm not sure what happened with our brine. I don't think I've brined cheese in about a year, so it's just been sitting in there. Oops, something was in our salt. Let's get that out. A little piece of cardboard. I've actually got to dissolve our calcium chloride in a tablespoon of water. We're gonna put one teaspoon of vinegar, white vinegar, into our brine. Most of your bad molds can't grow in a high salt concentration, so I think a lot of what we saw in our brine earlier was a lot of blue mold, but still, you don't want any mold in your brine for your cheese, so we're just starting over. 
Okay, so we've got our pellets mostly dissolved in this little bit of water. There's still a little bit in there. It's, it's fine. We're gonna go ahead and put this in with our brine. They'll continue to dissolve as we stir to get our salt dissolved. Let's break up these big chunks of salt. And getting this completely dissolved takes a lot of stirring, but this will completely saturate and dissolve in this water. It's just a lot of stirring. So once I get these big chunks broken up, I'm actually going to drink a cup of coffee. Just let this sit here and kind of naturally dissolve. So for Colby cheese, you're looking at a brine time of about two to three hours per pound of cheese. Sorry about my coffee maker in the background going. This is probably about a four and a half pound wheel of cheese. I'm going to have this in here for at least 12 hours of brining. Uh, last time I went on the lower end, somewhere in the eight hour range, and it definitely needed more salt. It tasted good, but it needed more salt. So we're gonna go a little bit longer with our brine. And hopefully this time we'll do a little bit better with that salty flavor that cheese really needs. All right, so I'm gonna just take a break, let this continue to dissolve, get my coffee in me, and then we'll be back to get the cheese into this brine. All right, the salt is dissolved in our brine. So we're gonna go ahead and get this cheese in there to start brining. So now that this cheese has been pressed, you can really see the color from the annata. Bright. Beautiful orange cheese. And that's our cheese. Mm. The little spot where I ripped it right there, it should be fine once we vacuum seal it. We're gonna go ahead and get this into the brine. <clears throat> because it's a saturated brine, it is gonna float. What you're gonna wanna do is sprinkle some cheese salt over the top of this. Now, I did not use specific cheese salt to make my brine because it's dissolved, so it really doesn't matter. But for dry salting cheese or um, adding cheese salt the way you do to cheddar, you do want to use a flaky cheese salt. So this is just kosher flaky salt, which is what cheese salt is. So sprinkle about a tablespoon of that over the top of your cheese. And about halfway through the brining process, you're gonna flip your cheese. And again, sprinkle about a tablespoon of salt on the top of your cheese. The cheese is going to absorb salt from the brine. So this is a way um, of adding your salt back to the brine. Additionally, it keeps all surfaces of the cheese um, absorbing salt throughout the whole brining process. So this can just sit out at room temperature now. You do want to lightly cover this with something so that you don't have any kind of flies or anything getting on it. I usually just take a piece of plastic wrap and put over the top of it. So that's what we're gonna do. And I'll bring you back once we take this out and get it into our cheese cave tonight. Okay, so it's been about a week since I took this Colby cheese out of the brine and stuck it in here into my cheese cave which is basically a wine cooler. It was my intent to show you on the video getting the cheese out of the brine and I totally forgot. Basically all I did was take the cheese out of the brine, took a sanitized cloth, dried it off and put it onto this sanitized board with a little um, draining mat under it. And it's been in here in the cheese cave which sits at about 52, 53 degrees for about a week, just open to the air, kind of drying down. Okay, so we've got our wheel of cheese here. Looks good, no moldy spots or anything. That's always important. 
Sometimes if you forget about it a little too long, you'll get a few little spots of mold. You can just wipe that off with a light brine and you're fine to go on about your business. For this Colby, we're gonna go ahead and cut it into quarters. If this were a round of cheddar that I was gonna age for a while, I would just use the whole round and vacuum seal it and let it age. You could also wax it. Some people just let the mold develop on the outside and just let it age in the cheese cave. My cheese cave is a wine cooler, so the humidity is really not where it needs to be in there to leave cheese open for more than about a week. Smells good. Now for Colby, it does not have to age. You can eat it now. If you want to age it, you can age it up to maybe three months, but it is a higher moisture cheese than uh, cheddar is, so you don't want to age it for a long time. It's very mild right now, so a little bit of aging on it will will sharpen that up a little bit, but I mean, very good cheese, very, it tastes like Colby should, kind of like a mild cheddar would be. We're gonna go ahead and put these into shrink wrap bags. This did brine for about 12 hours and I'm happy with the salt level on this. It's better than the last batch that I made, which I felt like needed a little bit more salt. So we're gonna vacuum seal these. So when I vacuum seal my cheese, I always double seal it. So when I double seal, that's our first line. I go just above that and do a second just seal. So it has two seal lines on it. In case one of them fails, you don't lose your vacuum in there. Um, also, I wanted to point out that some of these holes in this cheese could be mechanical. I'm thinking back now, we may have used the MA11 culture. I have to look back at the beginning of the video. The MA11 doesn't produce a lot of CO2, so some of these holes may just be mechanical from pressing. Um, one of the things um, you can find with stuff like when coliform bacteria gets in it, it usually blows out big holes. These all look either CO2 or mechanical, and the cheese tastes great, so they're not to be worried about. If this cheese had gotten um, contaminated with a coliform bacteria. Typically, you'll have a whole blown out section in the middle and the cheese tastes bad. This is good tasting cheese. So, perhaps mechanical, perhaps CO2. I've got to look back at the culture we used. This will be really good cheese for burgers on July 4th. So these that I vacuum seal, um, one I'm gonna put in our refrigerator for us to go ahead and start eating on, because like I said, Colby is, is a mild cheese that really doesn't have to be aged. The other one I'm gonna give to my parents so they can go ahead and start eating on it. And then the last two, I'll just put those back in the cheese cave and they can age for a little bit in the cheese cave. Again, we probably won't go more than um, one to three months on uh, aging those before we eat them. 
And that is it for your Colby cheese. Um, hope you enjoy the video. Hope you learned something. Try it at home.